Hi everyone and welcome to my first ever tutorial on uh, intellectual property law. The reason why I started making these tutorials was simply because, I don't know, as a student I tried sometimes to YouTube videos on how to understand different concepts and I couldn't find anything so I was thinking maybe there are other students like me out there who've, who have the same problem sometimes. I will cover the different aspects of intellectual property law, the different types of IP law. I will cover the cases and the legislation that covers it and further down the line when I'm doing trademarks I will draw some parallels to compare to US law but more than that it's going to be mainly focused on UK law. So to jump into it, this first tutorial we're just going to look at an outlook or or, or a kind of the framework of how IP law fits together because I think for many people it is important to realize that IP law it's an area where every separate that you have different separate rights covering different things but they all interrelate or they all kind of overlap in one way or, non or another this is very important to understand because when you're actually going into litigation or when you're when you're dealing with clients etc you need to appreciate that they want results but they don't necessarily care about how so just because something is a design from the outset doesn't mean that you cannot try to register it as a trademark to get more protection so they want results and you need to find the results for them the first right that that I will point out is trademarks law or trademarks now my handwriting is very crap so uh, thank you for bearing with me but you have trademarks which is the first right and what are trademarks when you're dealing with trademarks you're 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 dealing with different things you're dealing with brands for instance you're dealing with with uh, images you're dealing we're de dealing with reputation and what i mean with reputation is when you're talking about trademarks trademarks essentially is they they act as a guarantor of origin or an indicator of origin so it is something that people use to identify who they are or where their goods or services come from or what they're trying to sell. I mean, let's take an example. You, you would have Exxon or, or BT or, you know, Louis Vuitton. These kinds of things are trademarks usually. You will also have packaging. Under that, I will put the rule get up that people usually refer to. So if consumers look at, at that packaging and think, oh wait, that comes from this certain someone, then possibly potentially you could trademark that as well. You could also pro potentially pra trademark designs, but to avoid confusion, just ignore this one for a second and we'll get back to that when we're dealing with trademarks. Then you also have design rights. Designs cover things such as the appearance or its ornamentation its design is very self-explanatory and it's it's not a very big area of IP even though it's very widely used I mean very recently you've had the Apple and and Samsung disputes and the disputes that have been going on for quite some time now about uh, the iPad and how Samsung's uh, tablet looks the same the general gist is that design covers the appearance then you have copyright and copyright is an interesting one because because Sometimes people, at least in the UK, they, they misunderstand how copyright works or they don't understand quite how it works. They think that people have a copyright in everything and anything. I mean, I had a friend who, who told me I have a copyright in my name. Now, you do not have a copyright in your name, at least in the UK. Copyright covers, let's call it the creative industry. Things such as music, books, I under that will say literary works, so anything literary, dramatic works, so drama and and plays, sound recordings, and what I mean with sound recordings, I mean the recorded sound. So, so if you think about a song, a song you would have lyrics as a literary work, you will have music, the actual melody, but then you'll have a separate copyright for everything recorded which may be owned by someone else, etc, etc. If you've ever asked yourself what protection covers uh, computer software, well, copyright does. So I'll write PC. 
So PC programs, the coding, the actual coding is covered by copyrights. Patents is the other one you have. And patents, well, it concerns itself with inventions. Understand? Um, many people also quite don't understand how patents work. They think you can patent everything. And that's also wrong because you can only patent inventions. An invention, an invention is only an invention when it's new, when it is not obvious, when it's capable of industrial application. So I'm just going to write industrial application. And if it is not excluded, because you have certain subject matter which under the Patents Act have been deemed to be excluded from protection. And the biggest area of patents is the pharmaceutical industry. But you also have the technology industry. And when you're thinking about tech, you're thinking about something like cell phones, mobile, sorry, mobile phones, computers, speakers. And you've got big companies that usually have thousands of technology patents. You've also got a few other rights which fall under intellectual property. Well, for most of you out there, you would not even consider them, you would not look at them, but they are actually one of the er they are actually quite big areas. I mean, they influence qu quite a lot and they have a, have a lot of impact on on certain things. One is plant breeders rights. The other one is semiconductor chips which can also be covered under patents, funnily enough, if they satisfy the patent requirement. What are semiconductor chips? Well, every computer's got a processor, and that processor has a semiconductor chip, and it is that chip that's protected by this right. Much. So when you're studying IP law, you're mainly covering these four areas. Now the last thing I want to comment is that you potentially have one more right. The reason why I'm saying that potentially is because it is it it has been and it is still arguable whether this is an intellectual property right. Uh, the law of confidence it protects trade secrets. Uh, the definition lies in the name, the law of confidence. So it is it deals with confidential information. I will give you an example, and that's the Coca-Cola recipe. So you have the law of confidence. The problem with this, now I'm not going to only write trade secrets, I'm also going to write private information. But once you start talking about this, you're dealing less with commercial IP law and you're dealing more with, you know, human rights and then the potential right to privacy or privacy or whatever you want to call it. General know-how, not general know-how, sorry about that. Know-how, the difference between saying general know-how and know-how is that General know-how is just general information. Know-how might refer to the the steps and in, in doing things or the, the way you do things, you know, the process of doing things within the company. An example of this is one know-how might be how McDonald's they make how they make their dressing. You know, how does McDonald's make their burgers taste the same almost anywhere in the world? So the law of confidence as I told you. First of all, the argument is, is it intellectual property? But more importantly, is this property as a whole? Can you protect trade secrets? Can you protect know-how as property? More importantly, can you license it to others? Can you sell it to others? Can you assign it to others? Because intellectual property law is, is a heavily commercialized area. I mean, you, you, you don't only litigate. A lot of IP law actually has to do with how you commercialize it. How do you make money off your IP? And that's the biggest question with trade secrets and know-how and different confidential info as a whole. Can you actually license it? And that's a big question. It's a big question mark. But it is licensed in practice. It is licensed usually with, with the patents because with the patents also go a lot of confidential info on how to produce the work around it or how to work with it also for when you when you're looking at collaborations or or joint ventures etc you will you will most likely have a lot of uh, clauses in the the main license agreement as to the confidential information and the trade secrets because when you're creating a new invention together you do not want it to be disclosed until you've registered it you want the registry to be the disclosure if you think about patent law the rule in patent law is if something's been, well, in a nutshell, if something's been 
disclosed to the world, either by a registry or by someone going out saying, hey, my friend invented this, the rule is usually your patent is no longer new. If it's no longer new or novel, you cannot patent it. That's usually the rule. So you want to keep everybody on a hush-hush until you actually register it. And that's where the law of confidence comes in, because it protects your work before and after. Now, if we look at all of IP law, you have quite an overlap. Not only an overlap, but they work, they, they, they interrelate and they work together. I'll give you a good example. I will put my BlackBerry right here. My BlackBerry here is covered by all of these rights, including semiconductor chips. Within tr Actually, one more thing I want to add as a side note to trademark is the law of passing off. It's a separate tortious right, but the reason why I want to add it on the side is because some people have referred to it as the law of unregistered trademarks. Which technically I should have done at the start, which makes this entire video completely obsolete. But it's not really obsolete, I'll just add it now, is that you've got a no another right in the UK called the law of passing off. In other countries you've got a law of unfair competition. But it has been clearly set out by different judges, one of them being Lord Justice Jacob in L'Oreal and Belur, and you've also got the case of Hodg I think it's Hodgkinson's and Hobbs or something. They've all said that th we do not have a general law of unfair competition. Now passing off, it protects goodwill. And this goodwill is generated through use of your brand, more or less. So. If you if you got a little pub on the side street, you don't have to register the pub's name as the the flying automobile. That's a funny name. If you register that, it would cost you. You know, there are a lot of things, and it's it's it might be difficult and all of that for your trademark. So you don't necessarily have to register your name in the UK to get protection for it. If you use your name and if you have generated goodwill through the use, in other words, if people more or less if people recognize this as coming from you. The law of passing off will protect you against against other people trying to use your right. Now going back to my phone again. You've got a Blackberry logo here, which has a trademark. This little logo here for the buttons, they've got a trademark for that. Which means that this little logo right down here has a trademark. You've also got a passing off claim, potentially, in the use of the Blackberry name. The unregistered right if someone uses it, but if you've got a trademark right, I don't see the point in using passing off because trademark is a bit stronger actually and we'll see that later on or you could argue that as well, but I think so. So, that's what you have in relation to this product. You've got a design as to the phone and what it looks like, the appearance. You've also got copyright in the software, just in a nutshell, any, any you know, those default music or sounds or ringtones that you get with BlackBerry, they'll have a copyright in that as well. You've potentially got a patent for this touch touch uh, button here. They say that on average there are thousands of patents in relation to one phone and on average hundreds of patents are being infringed and, uh, and they're also saying that hundreds or thousands of patents that are actually being used when creating one phone are not even valid because someone else already has a patent for it. You've potentially got Confident, you know, confidential information or trade secrets, but not in relation to this phone, but in relation to the people working there on certain things they have done with the phone or how to use the phone, etc. That only they know. They might have uh, trade secrets or confidential information in relation to that. You've also got semiconductor chip right in relation to the processor that your phone uses, because nowadays with smartphones they use processors because they're so advanced. I mean, this one's got a dual core processor, I think. The, the new iPad has got a quad core, some separate one. So that's intellectual property law in a nutshell.